Well, good morning to you. I hope and pray that your semester is off to a great start. Uh, one of the things that we do at the beginning of each semester is kind of just talk about chapel for a couple moments, and that's what I want to do this morning. Uh, chapel for us is a really important part of our discipleship process here as a student, and we really believe that chapel is a place, and you guys, if you agree with me, you can, you can let me know. This is a place where when we come in here, God meets with us. He, it's a place where God encounters us a place of his presence, his love and grace and mercy, and where we grow in our relationship with him. And we really recognize that a, a lot of us, especially those of you that are coming in, come from different kind of church backgrounds and different uh, you know, church atmospheres. And so for some of you, this is a really comfortable place. And for some of you, this is, this is brand new. And so we wanna just lay out some expectations that I think will be helpful for you as you, as you come into chapel this year. Um, it's really easy to get to lose focus when you're here, get distracted. And part of what I want to just talk to you about is making sure that you're not distracted or also not being a distraction to somebody else. So a couple things that will be really important. Uh, scan in by 10.04 a.m. Okay, so if you are here at 10.05, you will be late. Okay, so make sure you leave enough time to be here. Uh, we want you to have enough time so that when you get in here, you can use the bathroom. Uh, you guys know those, those who've been here, those, those uh, doors back there are really loud. And so, again, no distractions. One of the things is you come in, please sit in one of the chairs. Don't sit against the wall. Don't move chairs. Uh, we want you to just be right there where, where the chairs are. Uh, we're going to ask that when you come in that you take off all your headphones, AirPods, earbuds as well. Please stand during worship. Hey, no side conversations while someone is speaking. Uh, here, this is really important. Chapel is not an opportunity to catch up on text messages or homework or sleep. Okay. So make sure you put away all your devices. I know, sad, okay. Uh, we will try uh, to end chapel around 11 o'clock every day. And so uh, I know why some of you are laughing, okay? Reverend Gail, all right. <laughs> so here, here's what's important for you. There will be a formal dismissal on the microphone every day. So sometimes we'll go after 11 o'clock, but just wait for that dismissal, okay? At 10.50 a.m., our chapel ushers will be stationed at the doors. Um, this isn't your cue to get up and get ready to get in line for lunch. Just, just hold where you are and, and wait for that dismissal. Sometimes around that 10.50 time is some of the most important times of our service here in chapel. So, again, we just don't want anybody to be distracted. And so if you, have, if you forget, as chapel goes along this semester, our chapel ushers, our student life staff, and our coaches will sometimes help remind you of those expectations from time to time. Uh, we wouldn't want you to lose chapel credit, and so that's what we're doing our jobs there. So here, would you guys commit, would you guys be willing to commit with us to come in ready every chapel to be focused and to be expectant of what God wants to do in our lives and our friends' lives during the chapel year? Amen? All right, thank you guys so much. And it's, it's my pleasure this morning uh, to introduce your chapel speaker, is our Vice President of Student Life. Would you welcome Reverend Gail as she comes? So, um, yeah, I am painfully aware that uh, it was one year ago today when we said that chapel would end by 11 most days. <laughs> and I would say that is the case most days. Uh, probably not today, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, it's so good to be with everyone this morning. Um, so welcome everyone back to this community. Uh, we're excited to be back together. We feel that what we have here is really special not because of something that we have done, but because of what the Lord has done. And um, if you think about it, really, it's a miracle that we can all come together and, and get along most days, right? From all the different backgrounds we have, different families of origin, different states that we are from. Uh, because you're going to find out pretty soon that, that we see things differently. Like, we've we got different opinions on this campus. Um, I'm originally from the West Coast. West Coast, thank you, President Kim, for that shout out yesterday. Um, from the West Coast, anybody from Washington, California, Oregon? Yes, thank you. There's a few. Okay. All right. Um, we do see things a little differently out there. Some may even say a little more accurately. Um, maybe. Uh, so, for example, for example, um, just a little thing. Uh, one of my favorite candies growing up were red vines. You know what red vines are? West Coast people, red vines. Okay, okay. So, so one of my hot takes is that Red Vines trump Twizzlers any day. Like, throw out that wannabe waxy candy, okay? All right, Red Vines, okay? My dear friend Jesus, 
my dear friend, Jesus, this is going to hurt some of you very deeply, but Jesus, he has gone on public record to say that Domino's is the best pizza in the world. Are you kidding me? I know, I know, I know. And I'm from the West Coast, right? I know, poor Jesus. <laughs> I'm from the West Coast. I would say it's Papa Murphy's Take and Bake. I know you want to understand that, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, Dre, he's from Ohio. <laughs> he thinks that LeBron James is the best basketball player of all time. I don't know. I don't know. What happened to Michael Jordan? Come on, right? Okay, see what I mean? <laughs> like, it's a miracle, right? It's a miracle. But that's part of what the college experience is all about, right? You come and you meet people with different backgrounds, different, different ways of seeing things. Maybe we even get challenged a little bit in the way that we see things. And really that's the same too, as we come to a, a Christian university. As followers of Jesus, we really do expect that Jesus is gonna challenge the way that we see things, ultimately, so that we see him better and appreciate him more for who he is. So this morning, um, I'm gonna make a confession to you. I chose today's text law several months ago for a very spiritual reason. I just thought it would be fun. And it is one of my favorite stories of the Bible, and I absolutely love it. And I think you're gonna, you're gonna see some of the reasons why as we go along today. But the really cool thing is that, that we may make our plans, right? But the Lord determines our steps. And as I've been studying this and planning and praying for all of us, I'm just, I'm absolutely convinced that this is what the Lord wants us to hear today. That he wants us to see through this text who Jesus is and what he does. Like we're supposed to see who Jesus is and what he does. And I believe this is so that we'll recognize it when we see his work, right? And how many of us want to be more aware of God's work in our lives? Amen? Amen? So we're going to see what Jesus does. And of course, this is right in line with this semester's pillar, right? We mentioned yesterday that we have, we have four pillars, kind of focuses for us. Last semester was his gospel, his presence. And this semester, it is his ways. So we're going to be looking at Jesus's ways as disciples, right? We're learning to do what the master does. And this morning, we're going to be reading from John chapter 9. We're going to look at John chapter 9. And we're going to do something just a little bit different. I'm going to ask you to listen to it. We're not going to have the words on the screen. And, and you might even just hold on a second turning there. But we're going, to, we're going to listen to it. We're going to listen from the NLT, which is a great version for listening. And, uh, and Dr. Dipple is going to read it to us. So if you would, I know, just uh, I want you to just kind of settle in. It's a little bit of a long chapter. But just kind of settle in, maybe even kind of close your eyes. And let's just listen to it together. So, uh, Dr. Dipple. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with a saliva, and spread the mud over the man, blind man's eyes. He told him, go, wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, nah, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they call Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Where is he now? They asked. I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees, because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it. So he told them, 
He put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God, for he's working on the Sabbath. Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see, so they called in his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, well, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said, he is old enough, ask him. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man Jesus is a sinner. I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied, but I know this, I was blind and now I can see. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed, I told you once. Didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they cursed him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Why, that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he's ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. Ah, you were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he's speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, Are you saying we're blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied. But you remain guilty because you claim you can see. Isn't that great? Like, oh my goodness, that is, that is such an amazing story. And maybe you can get a little bit of why I love it so much, why I think it's so great. First, like there's the daring of this heel guy, right? I mean, like, look at him go. I mean, he stands up to the Pharisees. He's not letting them bully him. And I, I love that because he's got this kind of quick wit, right? And I imagine the Pharisees are shocked because nobody ever talks to them that way. And then there are his parents. Did you catch that? Like, did they literally just throw their son under the bus? Like they did. Like what kind of parents are those? Like your son was just healed and now you're just worried about yourself, right? I mean, this entire story is incredible. No one, no one celebrates that this guy has been healed. Like it should have been viral praise news to God, right? Instead, it blows up into this huge drama, this conflict and insults and name calling. And the guy gets kicked out of the synagogue. Like, what is that? So as a, as a reader and a listener kind of looking into the story, we see, we understand what no one seems to understand. And then because I see, but no one sees to, else seems to see that, that a miracle was done here, people. I realize that over the years, I've tended to judge the characters in this story. 
the disciples were wrong. Like, what kind of parents are those? Those Pharisees, they're really the blind ones, right? And I'm being honest with you, my fascination with the story over the years really has been this crazy thing that's going on. Like, what is going on here? And I think this morning that that's actually the question that we're supposed to ask. That it's really easy to read a story like this and kind of kind of laugh and go, that's crazy, and just kind of move on. But instead today, the Lord wants us to sit and look at it and think, what really is going on? And I think that's what the Lord wants for us today. You know, as I've said, as I've read this story in the past, I focused on the characters. And we're going we're gonna to look at them a little bit today. But the story really isn't about them. It's about Jesus. And it's about what he does. And then the reactions to what he does. So it's not just a story about a blind man, but it's a story about Jesus, who is the light of the world. So we're in John chapter nine, and now you can turn there <laughs> if you'd like. You want to go ahead and turn to your Bibles to John chapter nine, if you're not there already. And while you're doing that, I want to give us just a little bit of a background as we're asking the question of what's going on here. So at this point in Jesus's ministry, he's already performed many, many miracles, and he's, he's hugely popular. Like the crowds are coming out to hear what he has to say. They're bringing people to be healed. He's already fed the 5,000. But at this point in our story, the tide of popular opinion has changed. And now the Pharisees have said publicly that anyone who acknowledges that Jesus is the Messiah is going to get kicked out of the synagogue, right? So there's tension in the air. And Jesus heals anyway. And he heals on the Sabbath anyway. And in the next few minutes, we're going to watch and see what Jesus does see what this miracle, this sign is pointing to. And I, I really want to invite you to pray with me this morning that, that God will do the supernaturally work that he does, right? And that he's the one that opens our eyes and that he helps us to see and to understand. Amen. So just, just pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for your word. We're so grateful for the ways in which you reveal yourself to us. And we just ask, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would touch our hearts, that you would transform our minds, that you would open our eyes and help us to see what you want to see because you are awesome and we want to see you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. Okay, so so what's going on here? little recap in the beginning. Text opens saying that as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who was born blind from birth. Jesus corrects the theology of the disciples about why the man was blind. And for our returning students, that's situational discipleship right there. And Jesus talks about doing the works of God. Then he makes mud with saliva, spreads it on the blind man's eyes, tells him to go wash in a distant pool. And this miracle happens. And scripture says, he simply, that he went, he washed, and he came back seeing. And, and remember, we're supposed to get an idea of who Jesus is and what he does. And so what we see is pretty powerful. So first, I think we can get a little bit of a glimpse of the beauty of Jesus here. His kindness, his compassion. As Jesus is walking along, he saw a man who was born blind. Jesus sees him. He really sees him as a human, as a person, and no one else appears to do so. Not the disciples who saw him as a theological problem, right? Not his neighbors who don't recognize him, not his parents who won't support him, not the Pharisees who are going to curse him, but Jesus sees him. He sees people. And this morning, at least to me, that is a challenge for those of us that are learning to follow Jesus, that that practice of seeing people. Jesus sees people, and he sees the man. And then he heals him, right? And he does it by, by touching him and spreading mud on his eyes. And the question's like, why would he do that, right? And scholars have all kinds of ideas for this. But I just want to pause for a moment and think, what kind of touch do you think that blind man was used to, right? Do you think he'd been treated well over the years sitting out there blind and begging? Do you think that maybe kids hadn't come by once in a while making sport of the blind man sitting on the corner? Or do you think that anybody might have walked by and put a little bit of money in the basket only to take a little bit more for themselves, right? 
Can you imagine just for a moment what Jesus' kind and caring and compassionate touch would have meant? Can you see the beauty there of Jesus? So then, of course, the spectacular thing happens, right? The one that gets everyone's attention and the man can see. And I want us to camp here for just a little bit to, to try to get the impact of that. Try to put yourself in the place of a blind person just for a moment. And I know that for those of us who have, have grown up all our lives seeing, we really can't do that. There's no way that we can really understand what a blind person has gone through. Not only the challenges that they have, but even, even the blessings of having these other heightened senses. But, but we're just going to try for a minute. So just try. Try to get a sense of how utterly transparent transformative this would have been try to imagine you've never seen a color you've never seen a shape you've never seen the mountains in the distance you've never seen how big the ocean is you've never seen stars in the sky you've never seen the faces of your friends or your family you've never seen a baseball game a basketball game a video art never read a book with the words on the page just consider for a moment, like the isolation and the loneliness you would feel as people are talking about their favorite sports and you have absolutely no comprehension for what that looks like. And it's been that way your entire life. And then in one instant, in one instant, it's all there. Like all the colors, all the sights, everything. What trees look like, what hills look like, what buildings look like games you see it and you finally understand like you finally get it what people have been saying all along you get it and when this man's eyes were open his life changed utterly changed it was completely transformed are we getting a sense of how big that is like getting a sense of how big this must have been remember i said that god wants us to see how he works so this then is really important so get this in the entire bible the only person recorded to perform a miracle of giving sight is Jesus, the only one. And some of you might be thinking, oh, wait a minute, I remember Paul, somebody prayed for him and he got his sight. That's true, but he was a seeing person who was temporarily blind. So Jesus is the only one, right? Then in the Old Testament, there are several verses and passages of scripture that make it very clear that God is the one who heals and then this is the kicker in the Old Testament in verses that point toward the coming of the Messiah, the healing of the blind, the giving of sight to the blind, that is a messianic function. That is what the Messiah will do. So look at these verses real quick with me from Isaiah 29, 18. Look at this. In that day, the deaf will hear words read from a book and the blind will see through the gloom and the darkness. Look at Isaiah 35, five. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Okay, those of you who have sung Handel's Messiah, do you recognize that? Isn't that awesome? Isaiah 42, seven. This is God speaking to the Messiah. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to release captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Do you see it, right? The Messiah will open the eyes of the blind. Jesus opens the eyes of the blind. Jesus is the Messiah. You got it? It is awesome. It is awesome. It's right there in our text. And he uses this physical miracle, right, to illustrate the spiritual truth. So the light of the world has come, and he will open the eyes of the blind. Like, that is big. That is really big. And this is good news, right? It should be, right? The one we've been waiting for is here. The healing of a man born blind is the sign pointing to Jesus. And really, unless you have a cold, dark heart... You would want someone who is blind to be able to see, wouldn't you? I mean, just think about it for a moment. If, if this was one of your friends, if one of your friends was actually physically blind, and maybe, maybe you have some that are, and you were actually a friend, <laughs> right? You would want that for them, right? So the question is, what is going on here? And I, I have to think about this because it's, it's just, I have to think about it. And I'm, I'm sure some of us have been in this place before. I know this has happened to all of us. How many of you 
like you've gone to your room and, and you're looking for something or you're looking for something in the store and you look and you look and like 20 minutes goes by and then finally you see it was right in front of you the whole time, right? You know that's happened to you. Or, or maybe you set down your wallet or you set down your keys and you never got the air tags even though somebody said you should get those, right? And then you call a friend and they find it, right? They find it, it was right there the whole time. And as I think about this, I think we have issues seeing our own stuff, right? When we've misplaced our own stuff where it's not where it should be, even though it should be right there. And I think then how easy would it be for them to miss Jesus, right? Jesus has clearly revealed himself in this miracle right there. Except the problem is he's not what they're looking for and he's not what they expect. And so they don't recognize him. And I think that's part of the problem, but there's more. As we look a little closer at the reactions of the people in the story, I think we're gonna learn something about our own hearts, about how we respond to Jesus when he's opening the eyes of the blind and we don't like what we see. Why? Because this really isn't just about Jesus opening the eyes of the blind physically, it's about Jesus opening the eyes of the blind spiritually. And the implication is that we are all blind. So remember, God wants us to see who Jesus is, right? And what he does, so we're more aware of his work in our lives, the work of others. So you ready for this? All right, let's look at the neighbors. The neighbors, initially, they're not sure who the healed man was, right? You get the sense that the blind man wasn't really important to them before, but now <laughs> there's a little drama. There's a little excitement. There's something going on. And then when he drops the name of Jesus, oh, this is getting really good. Jesus, he's the one. And then he healed when? The Sabbath? Oh, this is getting really good. And so they take him to the Pharisees, not because he was healed, but because it was on the Sabbath that he was healed, right? Busted. And so they're getting excited about this negativity and the drama that it's going to cause, watching it all go down. Then there's the parents. Their son is able to see for the first time. And they don't want anything to do with him. They don't want anything to do with it. They belong to the synagogue. And they value their connection, the social standing that goes with it. And they don't want anything to mess it up. And so they hide behind their son and they say, hey, he's of age. You can talk to him. And verse 22 says they did this because they were afraid. And then the Pharisees, they virtually ignore the miracle and they go right to attacking Jesus's character and their logic goes something like this like God says don't work on the Sabbath that means that godly people don't work on the Sabbath so a miracle could only be done by a godly person so blind man you're a liar you were never blind you were not healed and they start throwing these accusations around and they get angrier and angrier and they curse them and they eventually throw them out like just get rid of the problem right so do you see the responses there of people to the light of jesus to to jesus opening the eyes of the blind did you see that the love of drama at best right or at worst kind of an evil joy at the potential downfall of someone else or the parents self-preservation, fear of loss, loss of social standing or comfort, or the Pharisees, offense and anger, lashing out, denial that anything could be wrong with them, and actually, Scripture says, choosing, refusing not to believe. And I believe that each of these reactions were included in our text, inspired by the Holy Spirit, because they illustrate so perfectly the responses that we as human beings have when Jesus shines his light into the darkness of our lives. Amen. So what, what am I talking about? I'll just give you this little bit of an illustration. How do you respond when a bright light is shined in your eyes? <laughs> How do you respond? You're in a dark room. Somebody flips on all the lights, right? Imagine you're in your, you're in your room. It's dark. Maybe it's at night. You're asleep in your bed. It's cozy. And your roommate or your sweetmate 
just walks in the door and flips on all the lights. Like, what's your response? Like, get out of here, right? Like, knock it off. Like, what are you doing, right? That's our response to that. It's not like, oh, hey, thank you. I needed to get up now. It's like, get out of here. What are you doing, right? Am I right? Like, we've all had that experience, right? We walk out of a building and the light shines in our eyes. We kind of blink or maybe somebody's taken a flashlight and shined it in our eyes. What is our natural response? What's our natural reaction to a bright light shined in us, right? It's like, turn away, right? Turn away, cover your eyes or, or worse back, like turn your back, right? That's the natural response. We can't help it. So what happens to us spiritually when Jesus turns on the light, when he opens our eyes to the truth of who he is? I mean, that he's awesome. And he's amazing and he's glorious. And you think we'd be so excited, right? Like God is so awesome, right? And we're here at UVF because at some point the Lord has done that for us. He has opened our eyes. We have seen how beautiful he is and we love him and we worship him. And that's really the response that we see in the man born blind. But so often our first response to Jesus shining the light in the darkness isn't, thank you. I needed to see that now. It's, turn it off, right? Turn it off. It's the response of our flesh, of our sinful nature to a holy God. Amen. Because the same light, get this, this is crazy. The same light that shows us the glory and the beauty of Jesus also shows us the brokenness and the evil and the darkness in our own hearts. The same light, the same light that shows us the beauty and the glory of Jesus also shows us the junk in our own hearts. It exposes the idols, right? The things that we trust in more than God. It reveals that our, our facade is just that, right? We want other people to believe we're a good person. We want to believe we're a good person, right? What happens when he shines that light? What happens when he shines it on somebody else, right? When Jesus is at work over there, in somebody else's life. And we all know that it's a whole lot easier to see, right? When, when light is being shined on something, what's going on in our own hearts when there's a little bit of pleasure that God's doing a work on them and it's not on us, right? So do you see it? Do you see our natural reaction to light? Just kind of cover our eyes or to turn away. Again, the sin in us that's reacting to a holy God. We are like every single one of the characters in that story. I told you that when I read this story, my, my tendency was to judge them. It was kind of the fun of reading the story. And I'm realizing as I've studied this that, oh my gosh, if we've judged those characters, we've really judged ourselves because we do the exact same thing. We do the exact same thing. It's our natural tendency to recoil from the light so how will we ever see? It's impossible without Jesus. And that's the center of the truth that we need to understand today because the bottom line is we're all blind. Think about it. Everyone is blind. Not just the guy that was healed, the disciples, the neighbors, the parents, the Pharisees, everyone, and by implication, you and me, so what hope do we have here, right? Because a blind person can't heal themselves. A blind person can't make themselves see. If they could, they would do that, right? Most probably would do that. And if you just think about this in the physical sense, like just, just think for a moment. Is it possible, could a person who was born blind perform surgery on their own eyes? Like, is that even possible? No, of course not. Like, could somebody who is born blind like reattach a fallen retina in their own eye? Like, could they rehabilitate an optic nerve in their own eye? Absolutely not. It's completely impossible. And the Bible says that you and I are blind. That sin has completely obliterated our ability to see clearly. We've got original sin, right? That sin that we were born with, Adam and Eve, thank you very much. We've got the enemy, right? We've got Satan, right? Scripture tells us that the Satan has blinded the eyes of those who refuse to believe. 
And then we've got our own sin, right? Our own junk, which scripture says we love more than the light. Like we love the darkness more than the light. So uh, do you get this? Like it's hopeless. We are blind. We can't see and we can't heal ourselves. And this is where I hope this morning that the grace and the love and the beauty of God would just come to our eye that we would understand it this morning. Let's think about this. Jesus, the light of the world, he comes and he's the only one who sees. He's the only one who does because he has never sinned, which means he is the only one who can perform the surgery. He's the only one that can heal us. Amen. And you know how he does it? Do you know how the light of the world does it? He is willing to walk in total darkness for us. The one who is one with the father is willing to be separated for us. And the one who is life will suffer death for us. Like that is, that's the gospel that God made a way for us. Like, are you seeing the beauty of Jesus here? How awesome he is. So the message here is that we are all blind, that no one sees clearly, and Jesus is the only one that can heal us. Amen? So there's one more character in this story that I I just want to take a brief look at. It's the blind man himself. And as we do that, I'm going to invite the worship team to come up to the front. I would love to spend time looking at how he obeys Jesus. Just obeys Jesus never tells him why he's supposed to go and wash, but he does it anyway. And I love what that tells about faith and belief. And I would love to spend some time looking at this whole dialogue with the Pharisees because it shows how his faith is actually strengthened in persecution and trial. It's another really cool thing. Don't have time for that today. The bottom line, when we look at the blind man, what he does and how he responds to Jesus is totally different than anyone else in the story. And the question is, why? So we find an answer toward the end of our text. And I just, I'm just going to run through that a little bit. And I want you to see how the themes of who Jesus is and what he does gets tied up in the end. So the man's kicked out of the synagogue, right? And Jesus finds the man. And he asks them the question that I believe is the question God would ask all of us today. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe? And here is his response. Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. And that that question and that statement are so profound. It so perfectly illustrates to me the heart posture of a disciple. And Jesus says to him, you have seen him and he is speaking to you. And what is the man's response? Verse 38, listen to this. He says, yes, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. He worshiped. And so the man born blind is the only one in the story who sees Jesus for who he really is. You catch that? He's the only one in the story who really sees. And so there are some Pharisees they are standing nearby close enough to hear and to see what's going on. They hear Jesus say, I entered the world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, to show those who think they see that they're blind. What? The Pharisees say, are you saying we're blind? And you can hear the offense, right, in that statement. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, but you remain guilty because you claim you can see. And right there, we see the difference between the man and everyone else in the story, the play on the physical sight versus spiritual sight. Why was he the only one to see Jesus? Because he knew he was blind. He knew he was blind. Think about it. Did Jesus come to give sight to those who can already see? Is it the healthy that need a doctor? No, he came to give sight to the blind. Everyone else in the story thought they could see, right? 
everyone else didn't thought they didn't need Jesus to open their eyes. And so the light shines on their life and they turn away. And the question that this text demands us to ask is, do we realize that we are blind? Do we realize that we are the ones who don't see? We are the blind ones. And have we seen through this story how awesome God is that Jesus, the light of the world, would come specifically to open the eyes of the blind. That is you and that is me. And that is awesome. Amen. That is awesome. That miracle of healing, as amazing as it was for someone physically born blind, can you begin to comprehend how amazing it is for us who are spiritually blind? Do you think, do you think, as much as a person born blind has a concept of color or all of those things, do you think we have a concept of forgiveness? Do you think we understand love? Do you think we understand faithfulness? We understand how bad evil really is. We understand the difference between good and bad. Do you think we who are physical can understand those spiritual things? Jesus has come to open our eyes. Amen. And I just want to invite you to stand with me as we we close here. And just take a moment to reflect on what God may have been speaking to you today. Just maybe hold out your hands before you and just turn your heart toward the Lord. There's a couple ways we can respond to a message like this this morning. Maybe some of you want to respond in worship. I mean, maybe through this text, Jesus showed more of who he is to you. And you see more of his greatness and his glory and his compassion and his power. And you just want to respond in worship. And you can say, oh, God, I believe. Thank you so much. I worship you this morning. And maybe he's shown you some areas that he's at work in your life, right? Maybe he's reminded you as you've been looking at the responses of the people where you've been angry and you've been offended and you've wanted to preserve yourself or you've gotten caught up in the drama and maybe the Holy Spirit would be pointing and saying, I'm at work over there. I'm shining the light over there. Do you see it? I'm working over there. And this morning you would say, God, I just, I lift up those areas to you. I lift them up to you, God, do your work, shine the light. I don't want to turn away. I don't want to hide my eyes. God, have mercy on me instead, God. I want all that you have. Help me, Lord, to come to you, amen? And maybe for some of you, it's just simply the prayer, open the eyes of my heart. God, I want to see you. Maybe, Maybe you feel like you don't yet this morning, but you say, God, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart. We're just going to sing that chorus as a response this morning. That's our prayer. Just our prayer as we close. We're going to sing that chorus, open the eyes of our heart. And that would be our closing prayer. Amen. Let's just do that this morning.
prayed this very thing. He prayed this very thing to the Ephesian church. He said this, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened. And get this, in the NLT, it says, I pray that your hearts would be flooded with light. Oh God, that you would flood our hearts with light. And you know, the really cool thing here is that Jesus later tells his disciples, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. So Jesus, the light of the world, opens our eyes, floods our hearts with light so that we can be his light. Amen. Isn't God awesome? Isn't he awesome this morning? Oh, he is so good. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for who you are. God, we pray and ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts. Lord, we don't want to admit we're blind. We don't want to see it. But God, we pray that you would teach us the truth because we want to see. Help us to see you. Teach us to see you. We love you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give thanks to the Lord this morning? God is so good. God is so good. God bless you. You can head on out if you want. If you want to stay and pray, you're welcome to do that. God bless you and have a, a wonderful day. are now open it's a beautiful day to bring your hope and focus on the fact that you were chosen i motion that you give it everything you got stop Hold up. look again i bet that you'll see god real. keep your eyes open every day of the week there's so many things that god wants you to see so come on. it's a beautiful day in the house of the lord so come on in so come on in the door is open